Nick Bradley, welcome to the Great Good Book Club. Thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, we're here to talk about this brilliant book called The Cat and the City, which is your baby, which is, which is out right now. Yeah. Um, it is an incredibly complicated sort of polyphonic novel with lots of different bits and pieces in it with cartoons and photographs and uh, all set in Tokyo. Um, could you tell about lots of different characters who all interact with each other, all linked by the cat? So could you tell me a bit about the plot and how you came to write it? It's a really great question. Um, and it's funny that you describe it as polyphonic because that's actually also how I think of it. Um, so I suppose one of the, one of the big debates is, is uh, with, with these kinds of things, is it a collection of short stories? Uh, is it a link collection? Is it a novel? Um, but to me, I think, it, I think of it as a novel. Um, and uh, I think it came about the way that it is because uh, I started writing it when I was doing the MA in creative writing at UEA. And um, I think for my first workshop, I tried putting in a first chapter of a, a novel that I wanted to write. And I found it very frustrating workshopping a novel because people started to talk about all of the things outside of the piece that you, you put in. Um, so then I thought, well, um, the best way to get around this problem is to workshop it in segments, to call them short stories, but to really always plan to bring them together. Um, so that's, I suppose that's how it came about. Yeah. But it's a highly complicated uh, novel for a, for, a, for a debut. I mean, it's, a, it's such a, I mean, I, sort of the chaos that must be going on in your brain when you're writing it. I mean, I had, I mean, there's so many different characters. How did you plan something as complicated as this? Oh gosh, yeah. It, I mean, yeah, my, I think my, my mind is a bit chaotic, yeah. Um, so, how did I plan it? Um, I think it, it, it sort of came about over time. And uh, funnily enough, there were lots of stories that, there were, there were stories that I wrote um, involving certain characters that I cut. Um, so it, it became just a sort of a process of, of um, over time, I would think, oh, I really, I really want to see what happens to this character or that character. And it just sort of grew organically from that. Um, I do remember at one point when I was getting it together to send it out to, to, to my agent, um, I do remember actually plotting out a, a map of, of with all the story titles and then drawing lines but uh, i i have that that page somewhere but the lines just became you know it was just everything was connected and it, it became a bit silly and that, it was at that point that i thought this is really a novel and um so, so i mean there, there have been lots of lots of novels in the past that have have tried to create uh, multi perspective uh, something like Pere Gorio by balzac uh tries to build up a city um, but by using different perspectives and I, and I think that 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 was really what I was going for with the, the polyphonic thing was I, I wanted to build up a city and a city contains you know multiple voices multiple perspectives um, and I mean to be quite honest like one of the inspirations behind the book is the Canterbury Tales in a funny way um, because I, I've always been a big Chaucer fan and um, one of the things I loved about Chaucer, as, as opposed to sort of uh, Boccaccio's De Cameron or something, the thing I loved about Chaucer was that he created a cross-section of society. So he had everyone from, you know, the, the, the knight to the squire, like, down, you know, all the way down the, the, the social uh, hierarchy. So I kind of wanted to create something that had uh, different voices and different perspectives. Yeah, d does that answer the question? Sorry, I think I've gone off topic. No, 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 you have. But is it, is it, is it effectively um, uh, a love letter to Tokyo? Um, and the book opens with a fantastic um, tattooist uh, and this rather brilliantly enigmatic girl who comes in and asks to have the map of Tokyo uh, tattooed on her back, which is glorious. Um, uh, so I presume you spent a lot of time in Tokyo. Uh, tell me, could you tell uh, us a bit about the plot of the book, such as it is, so that we can understand a tiny bit about it, a bit more about it? Yeah, okay, the plot. Do I remember? Um, right, so... <laughs> um, so one of the... One of the things with the... So, 
the idea with uh, the, the tattoo on the back, I suppose, was that um, there could be this idea that, that what's actually happening is, is happening in the tattoo. Um, and I suppose the plot of the book is, is there is a stray cat and the cat is moving through Tokyo. And this is in the lead up to what was going to be the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, which obviously now are not happening. But um, the idea was that the cat was going to brush up against people who seemed like they weren't connected. But as the um, as the stories progress, you start to realize that they're more and more connected. Um, I suppose the main plot, the driving plot of the of the novel is sort of centers around one family, um, two brothers who have become estranged. and One of them is homeless. Uh, I won't say who the other one is because that would give it away. Um, and I suppose for me, the plot of the book really is about families and how we stay together and how we forgive. And um, yeah, if I had to boil down the plot to, to sort of just a simple sentence, it's, it's really about how we can stay connected and how it is hard at times to maintain these um, connections of friendship or relationships um, and that it takes work and they do break down, but that it is valuable for us as humans, as a society to maintain these connections. Yeah. And uh, did you spend a lot of time in Tokyo yourself? Yeah, I did. Um, in Tokyo, I, so I lived in Japan several times, but uh, in Tokyo in particular, I spent three years working for a Japanese company as, as a, a translator. Yeah. Oh, so you're the translator character then? <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose Flo is the character who I identify with most. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's the most fascinating culture, that Japanese culture, which you really put, Im embedded into the book, you know, of the salary men, uh, who just seem to be like sort of a subset of humanity in an odd way. Would you say that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's in terms of working culture, because I worked for a very old fashioned traditional Japanese com company, you know, it, uh, and that sort of yeah there is definitely this this you know you go to university you graduate from university you get your job and then you become a salary man or you become an office lady or ol as they call them in japanese um and you know there's very much like a kind of uh, a uniform that people put on and it, it yeah it, it definitely in japan that you know for a society that has this uh this idea of cohesion and everyone is everyone is the same there are a lot of subsets um which in japanese they call zoku so sort of clans or families but definitely like the way you dress and the way you act it puts you into these into these mini categories like like the salary man or the office lady yeah yeah um there's a wonderful scene about with uh with uh which is basically sort of drinking office politics which is one of my favorite scenes in the book where 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 one of your poor characters is forced to keep going out drinking um that sort of weird sort of drinking culture is quite odd in japan as well isn't it yeah i i so i I've, i had a lot of experience with that you know living and working there so um yeah i, I mean to be honest i enjoyed it um i i wasn't quite so so negative uh, as, as as that character i think it's the street fighter 2 yeah makoto yeah um yeah i so I, I saw that in different in different variations in different companies and, and different organizations but um yeah the night out is, is is definitely it's almost like that's part of work you know you're not you're not clocking out you're you're just carrying you're carrying on your your work relations and you're going on to a bar and and drinking yeah so and actually Funny you're enough, not allowed like, to just, go home until the big boss goes home, or you're not allowed to go home until the big boss lets you go home. Well, one of the scenes in that actually is one of those stranger than fiction moments because one of the things that he's watching, where the the boss is kneeing the, the young girl in the backside, I, I actually witnessed that. That that's real. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it had to be real because it was so obscure. But he sort of, he's kneeing her up the backside, isn't he? It's just the, the funniest thing I've heard. It was genius. Genius. Yeah. Um, you were also brilliant about that sort of homeless culture as well uh, uh, in Japan. Did you research that? Did you, were you, did you witness that? Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, that was, that was actually one of the first things I noticed. Because when, when I first arrived in, in Tokyo, um, 
I was just staying in Tokyo for three nights, but I remember going out to go get something to eat. And that was one of the first things that I saw because I, we were staying in Shinjuku and, and I remember seeing lots and lots of people um, sleeping in cardboard boxes. You know, they'd taken their shoes off neatly. Um, and I suppose these weren't, these weren't the homeless people that I'm writing about, but these were people who were actually salary men who were maybe between apartments um, and they were just sleeping in these cardboard boxes with their suits hanging up. So they were going to go to work the next morning. And this was when I got really interested in, in the idea of homelessness in, in, in Japan. And um, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of research for that story. Um, it, it, I mean, I suppose it, it, all, it all began when I was in Japan and I would walk around and I would see things. And um, there's a, a particular area in Tokyo that's not on the map called Sanya. Um, and it's it's actually become a kind of homeless community and they, they have a similar one in Osaka and they kind of sprung up around these uh, work exchanges where people would labor exchanges where people would sort of camp near those places and they would go get work just by the day and then they would use that money often you know uh, for, for whatever often for drinking I have to be honest um, but yeah, so yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I did a lot of research from England too. Um, the, I've written in the back in the acknowledgement some of the some of the, the material that I looked at. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was definitely something that connected with me because it was one of those things where um, it was one of those things that was there but not really acknowledged by society. And and that was when I discovered that there are people who are marginalised in Japan. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm rambling. No, you're not rambling. And are you a, are you a fluent uh, Japanese speaker? Uh, yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd say I am. Um, it, it's getting rusty. Um, it's getting rusty, but yeah. yeah. Um, and where is, uh, your job was, was as a translator, though. So did you read Japanese at, at university? No, I actually read English literature. Um, so, uh, yeah, I did English literature and then I did a, a, a master's in English literature. And then I was going to do a PhD um, on Chaucer, actually, but then I decided that I would go to Japan instead. Uh, so I went to Japan uh, originally as, uh, on the JET program as an English teacher. Um, but while I was there, I became obsessed with the language. Um, and yeah, so uh, I suppose that was my, my path to, to linguistic ability was I just would, would study it by myself a lot. And yeah. And, I had a teacher who I used to go see once a week. Um, yeah, yeah. And can you can you actually write it? Because there's lots of sort of beautiful imagery in the book, which is with all the letters, and and there's a, a, a sort of chapter about how breaking down um, a word. Um, I forgot what the word is now. Where uh, where it's uh, I can't remember what the word is, but there, but you so you obviously got obsessed with the uh, with the with the graphology of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ka kanji uh, is it's incredible. I think I think I know. Is is it the one where it's the the, the man resting against the tree? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's a really I. It's it's difficult to because I, I think you, you studied Russian, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah. 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 So it's it's a difficult thing. I think people who study Chinese and Japanese, um, it's the Chinese characters that are really really fascinating to me. It's it's the way that they're built up from uh, simpler characters that make up more complex ones. And I remember because I moved to Japan with lots of uh, English speakers from all over the world, America, Australia. But and I remember people take to speaking Japanese quite quickly. But the the big kind of stumbling block is is reading and writing. And I remember people would look at kanji and just say, oh, that's too complicated. But the, the trick was to look very closely and to see how it's just made up from really simple elements. So you have a radical that always means water and you put that on the left side of the character and that, that means you're always dealing with a liquid. So th there were loads of shortcuts. Um, it's a really clever writing system and it's one where you can just look at a character and it, it, instead, of it just, uh, instead of it giving you like a kind of word with a neat definition, um, it can be a, a whole range of ideas or concepts um so it's it's a really brilliant writing system yeah you, you sound like somebody who loves uh, loves a crossword <laughs> i 
I, I do, yeah. I don't do them much. My dad is, my dad is mad on crosswords. So maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, that's my trajectory is I'm, I'm going to be a crossword. <laughs> but it does sound because that, 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 that sort of, you know, the dopamine hit from doing something like that is basically breaking down a language into little tiny bits and pieces and then like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, no, it was very brilliant. I like the idea uh, in the book that the sort of the Tokyo 2020, which obviously hasn't happened, is looming large, like a sort of, I don't know, like a sort of all consuming thing sweeping through the city. I mean, were you there during the build up to 2020 and was that how, how it felt like? Um, I was, so I was working in Tokyo when Tokyo won the bid for the Olympics. Um, but I, I left, um, I think, you know, what, so I was back in the UK in 2015. So I, I kind of left before it happened. Um, but that, I think that, that kind of, especially like the kind of the clean sweep, uh, the, you know, clearing the homeless off the streets, that element, um, that came not, not just from Japan, but, um, that was from reading, uh, about former Olympic cities and how, that was a very common thing. And, and also the euthanization of, of cats and dogs, that was, um, that was cut from the book, but that was another element that I wanted to write about, um, was, was that, yeah, I mean, often in Olympic cities, they do round up cats and dogs and they, and they euthanize them. And, and, and also, yeah, homeless people are, are displaced and, and it's, it's an element of the games that we don't really talk about, but it's happened in all, uh, uh, previous Olympic cities, um, yeah, I, I, I did get, I did get a sense of the excitement um, when, when Tokyo was announced as being the 2020 city. But I also there was a, a large group of people who were really disgruntled because um, they still felt that Japan, the government, hadn't dealt with the tsunami, the 2011 disaster. So there were still issues with the Fukushima power plant and there were still displaced people. So there was a large voice of, of uh, you know, quite, quite angry. There was an angry group of people who weren't happy that, that Tokyo was, had been picked. Um, and I thought I would write about that, but I suppose I, I, I kind of veered away from the, the tsunami and the disaster because I feel like it's been written about so much and it's been written so well by people who really have a right to to write about it so i i i i, I moved away from from writing about that because I, I just didn't think it was my my place yeah and did you did you always want to become a, a writer because your trajectory sounds very like you did and um and did you also you're about the third or fourth person i've spoken to in very recent weeks who's just come from the uea creative writing course and so what's so fantastically magnificent about it? Oh gosh, so yes, uh, I've always wanted to be a writer, but I was too shy and I never shared anything with anyone. Um, so, and, and I've, I've been writing quietly by myself for a long time, but you know, and I would show it to friends and things, but I, I never, you know, everyone talks about rejection and, and, and agents and, and, um, and I think I just, I just thought, well, I know I'm going to be rejected, so I'm not going to bother. Um, and I, so I wrote lots and lots of novels that I would get about 20,000 words into, and then I would just go, oh, there's no point, and i put it aside. <laughs> um, but I think getting accepted to UEA was the first, that was the first thing I kind of tried for, and getting in really gave me um, confidence to, to say, well, yeah, you can, you can, you know, why not give it a go? Um, so, yeah, um, what's great about UEA? Uh, that was the second part of the question. Um, what's great about UEA are all the other students who you go through the programme with. It's, you know, you imagine 30 people just like you who um, are um, incredibly passionate about literature, are all at different stages in their lives. So. Um, there are people in, in their early 20s, but there are also people in their 60s. Um, and everyone's from different walks of life. Everyone has different experiences. You know, you have journalists, you have, um, you know, you have the, the crazy person who lived abroad for a long time. You have uh, 
um, lawyers, so all sorts of different people, um, but all of them passionate about writing and about literature. And yeah, I, I, what else is great about it? I suppose reading tons of other people and their work, their work in progress and seeing seeing the things that they're doing well or the things where they're kind of where they could improve that really gets you thinking about how you could improve or, or the things that you do well and, and the things that you need to improve so yeah who, who were the writers that you, who you spoke to because I, I might know them uh kate weinberg okay that's the truants isn't it yes the truants and, uh, and uh uh harriet tice who wrote blood oh, orange blood um, orange i know her yeah so were, that, were that either of them in your class Harriet, I knew because we took, um, we, we both did a, a kind of masterclass that Ian Rankin did when he visited. Wow. So yeah, I know Harriet from that. So we, we were in, because Harriet did crime. So, um, but yeah, I, so I got to know her through that. Uh, yeah. It, it, it sounds like a sort of blissful, uh, um, sort of a, almost bucolic experience. Do you know what I mean? The idea of all these writers all together in a in a uh, in a classroom it sounds very lovely indeed um uh, ha tell me a bit about your publishing experience then so this the cat in the city was workshopped at uea and then what happened next um so it was workshopped at uea um i yeah so i i, I met my agent um kind of informally and talked to him about the project and um he was he was always really great and really supportive and even even when in the early stages of it um so then i i just put my head down and and, and got together something i think you know i showed that to him had some notes on it and uh you know obviously um edited it a bit um yeah and then at La atlantic i just when i met them i knew they were the right people because i ran I ran the idea of the manga and and some of the some of the kind of weird weirdness of the book past them and they were not only were they saying yes we like it but yes you can do it more we'll encourage you to do it more so you know they helped me um i i the, the illustrator mariko who, who drew the manga so I, I i met her through um someone who i went to school with so she's i, I didn't know her personally but um, got in touch with her through a friend because I, I I was asking friends, you know, do you know anyone? And um, so a friend from school put me in touch with Mariko. Um, but Atlantic were really encouraging with with doing like those kind of uh, strange things uh, that, that, that the book does. Yeah. Um, and this is the killer question that every writer hates. Um, are you doing another book at the moment or have you just having a pause and taking in the fact that you've actually been published? Uh, I've I've started something. Um, my I would have started it earlier had it not been for my PhD because I had to hand in my PhD in in January, and that that was just yeah. Oh God. <laughs> um, so so but now I've passed. PhD in sorry, what's your PhD in? So it's it's on um, creative writing and, and Japanese literature. So it, it looks at the figure of the cat in Japanese literature. So um, I looked at three Japanese authors who had, um, over the course of the 20th century, had kind of uh, popularized the cat as the cat book, you know, in, in Japanese literature. Yeah, it's a bit weird, but um, so yeah, I finished that, I handed that in in January and I did the Viva in April, but um, yeah, and I wanted to start a book, writing a book earlier, but I just knew that I, I was in danger. If I did that, I was in danger of not handing in my PhD, which my my cross crossword dad would would not have been happy with. <laughs> so, um, so now that I've finished that, yeah, I, I'm I'm working on something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and is it or is it set in Japan again, or uh, is it or are you going closer to home? It has a Japan connection, and part of it will be set in Japan. But um, yeah at the beginning the the part that i'm I'm writing at the moment the part is, is set in england um but yeah i mean this all might change that's that's the that's the only danger of saying yeah i'm working on this thing now is that i might decide i don't want to do this and it might be set on mars or something and is, and is your uh is your cat with you has it as uh, he or she 
she is she is but i shut the door because she always comes in um when i'm doing interviews and sort of distracts me so so yeah, i shut the door I mean, only, only only she is the superstar of of the whole book isn't she yeah definitely yeah did you yeah. did you have a cat when you were in japan i didn't no um and i'm from a family of dog people as well I, I, and I, I I wouldn't say I was a dog person or a cat person. I'm definitely an animal person. I, I like I like both. Um, but no, in in Japan I didn't have a cat. But um, that, I suppose one of the the reasons why I wrote the book was because in, in Japan there are so many stray cats in, in 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 Tokyo in particular. So near my apartment where I used to work every day, uh, walk every day, um, there were just so many stray cats, and and people from the community would go out and feed them and look after them. Um, so yeah, I think the first time I started trying to write about Tokyo, there was always a cat because just on the street, but there are just so many cats, yeah. And did you, did you write in cafes and things like that? Are you, are you a cafe writer? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I love writing. So I've got, I've got some noise cancelling headphones. Um, and yeah, I love to write in public. Um, I, I don't know why, but I think when, you know when I was writing in Tokyo, I think I, I I think I got into the cafe writing thing in Tokyo because I I didn't want to stay in my apartment because it was it was tiny, you know. You always want to get outside, and the best place is yeah, go get a cheap coffee somewhere and, and sit in a cafe. So I, I think that's probably that was my gateway to being a cafe writer. Yeah. Um. But well, Nick, listen. Congratulations on your fantastic book, <laughs> The Cat and the City. So you can see Thank it. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, and good luck. It's had great reviews and everything. You must be really excited. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird, isn't it? Because it's, it's a global pandemic game. It's not how I imagined the book coming out, but it, it's amazing. I'm really, really, uh, I'm delighted that, that people are, are reading it and are liking it. That's, I think that's the only thing you could wish for as a writer, isn't it? Well, yeah. listen, huge congratulations. And, uh, and thank you very much for coming onto the site. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much for having me.